Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, my name is Sam Tai. I'm a applied research scientist uh, working at Mobile Vision Group in uh, Facebook. Our team focuses on uh, efficient deep learning solutions for computer vision applications. So I'm doing this talk on efficient deep learning for computer vision on mobile devices. So um, today we'll talk about a few different topics. I'll show a few um, examples of AR on mobile devices. And then um, since we're actually running things on the mobile devices, we need to be able to um, make the models that can actually run efficiently. And if, how do we do that? We try to make them efficient. Another way to do this is actually doing automatic research. And finally, I'll show um, an open source version of MS RC and to go, which is um, we thought we had time um, and talk about uh, how we made it, uh, made it fast. So, um, so here's the body tracking work. You can see the person is trying to move around, and um, butterflies are attached to this body. So what's happening is that on the phone itself is that we're, we're running a, a person key point detection model, where the key point is like the joints of the body, the elbows, the wrists, the shoulders, the hips. Uh, with these, uh, like a skeleton, you can then attempt different uh, graphical effects onto the, uh, the person, as, as you see, we're seeing a little bit on the phone right there. Um, this is another. Sort of like a video communication device uh, that we actually uh, released last year. Uh, it has some smart intelligence built into it. As you've seen in the uh, demos right there, where people are trying to run around, see the image, and the, the camera can still follow the person. So, what's happening in, inside is actually there's also a person detection model trying to figure out where the person is, finding out his body pose. And then, with that, you can actually follow the person around. So. Um, you don't have to worry about standing always in front of the video camera, video conference uh, device, and still be able to walk around and still talk to the person across from the across the video connection uh, seamlessly. Um, this is another uh, fun thing we did. This is called Instagram Tags. So this is a. Uh, for Instagram. So, have you used uh, a lot of uh, QR codes? I know that a lot of uh, different uh, communication uh, chats or apps use this to connect, uh, connect with different people, and people can use that to, um, you don't need to type in the other people's IDs. Um, Instagram actually didn't have that feature uh, for a long time. But however, when they looked at this problem, they wanted to be a little bit more open. Because in this ground, you can actually just search for a username. So instead of using like a machine learning, machine readable code only, we became what we approached just doing like a human readable code while machine can also read it. So we came up with this for Instagram name tags. What's running in behind is also a machine learning organ that does uh, uh, text detection, the logo detection, and then using optical character recognition to recognize the text. So a lot of these actually are all run on the mobile device. So how do we actually make mo if it models that are efficient? Um, there's a lot of things that, do. there's a lot of challenges um, to, 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 to be able to run on, uh, on the device. You need to, get, you need to um, tackle several different things. Sometimes you'll need higher accuracy. This is mostly because if you're doing uh, AR attack, um, you want higher accuracy because if it's not accurate, you'll see that there's actually jaggedness, so it's not a really good uh, experience. You definitely would want faster speed for uh, the reason that you want to run real time. Um, 
But for mobile devices, typically the RAM is much smaller than compared to like GPU devices. So you want also the memory footprint to be small, where the memory footprint is that um, when you're actually running the device, uh, so you're running the inference, you want this, uh, the model, the model weights, the model the activations to be small. Also, you want the, uh, the, the package of uh, that model also to be small, where the package model may be um, transported over the network or actually is funneled into binary. So you all also want those to be small. So um, to just give a sense of like uh, the actually the um, complexity of different models over this developed over the years, shown here is a graph of all the all the pretty popular uh, networks that's been that's been released. Uh, on the top is the AlexNet, which is um, which was one of the first models that revolutionized deep learning. Um, it was uh, it was published in 2012 and became sort of like the uh, image that the benchmark or reference that people would cite. Um, this one um, actually had a very sharp, didn't have too much of that. Um, and it was actually not a too big of a model. Uh, VQD came out later uh, showing that if you just put in more weights, uh, you can actually train a bit much better, gaining a much better accuracy. So you can see that it actually improves the rec recognition accuracy. Um, later on, there's some works like the Google event, Reset. Instead of um, using larger nets, uh, they actually looked into trying to um, increase the depth of the network to try to improve the performance. Google in it was the first one that actually be, was able to train more than um, a few ten, tens of uh, layers. Resident on the other hand um, figured out a way to train based on residuals. With that, they can actually train like 30 to 50, and I've seen there's been works on training with 100 and up to 152 layers. So these are like the larger models that typically that can't run on mobile devices. Um, on on uh, GPUs, it's also quite heavy as well. So people have started looking to using smaller models. Screensnet was one of the earlier ones that actually was able to uh, uh, use only um, like 500 kbytes to to uh, to run the inference. Uh, with that, it still achieves the same performance as the Alex model, but it's still not getting to the same accuracy as uh, BGG, Google, with and ResNet. MobileNet was a uh, work that, that was done by Google. It was a pretty efficient model. You can see that it uses only a, a mega flop size of uh, about only 500 mega flops, but it achieved a top one accuracy that's similar to BGG. You have also different flavors of MobileNet, uh, reducing it to um, just, uh, almost a fourth of its size. With, this, with sacrificing some, some accuracy. Shufflement is another flavor of um, an efficient model that was developed um, um, from another company. So these are different types of networks. You can see that there's a trend. Um, these were actually proposed, I think, in just two years ago. These was much earlier. So there's a trend to actually try to make all these models efficient so that they can run on, um, run on GPUs faster or even like mobile devices. But how do we actually make these models efficient? Well, um, one, one, one simple way to actually reduce these, um, to make these models more efficient is by pruning. Um, in these networks, um, there's actually a lot of ways um, that may not need actually, well, may not be that important. So if you can actually figure out like the different ways, different information, and figure out the ones that that's important, you can then try to prune these out. You typically can uh, use these prone approach by, to prune the waste by uh, sometimes up to nine times, between three and nine times based on the model performance. Um, you can also then do quantization, where uh, you quantize the represent representation of the waste. Uh, to just give an example, shown here is a kernel size, uh, called, say a convolutional kernel of four by four. Typically, we only have a convolutional of five, so this is just for uh, illustration. Uh, once we have these uh, kernels, we can do Kamey's clustering to um, cluster into different indices. Um, the colors show the indices, and the number of uh, the number show numbers here show the index. So you can actually just rep represent the whole original weights by using the cluster centers and the centroids. However, if you just you, if you just use these directly, you'll find that because you did some quantization, your accuracy actually drops quite a bit. 
So you need to do some sort of fine tuning. And the way you do fine tuning is that you do, um, you also run the same network, you figure out the gradient update rates. And then, because you know the assignments of these different indices, you can as associate them together, and then you do a, an average based weighting to update the weights again. You typically, you can, when you use this approach, you can regain the losses that's due to quantization. Um, Shown here is a, a, a graph of if you use a pruning and quantization to quantize a model. Um, this is a model that's a, a already pretty efficient. This is a small model with a, a, model, size, a model size of just around 1.8 megabytes. Um, this one has an accuracy of um, 40 or 50 something. So if you do pruning and pruning print from the original size to the sparse size, you can actually get it around with by pruning away 63% of the parameters. And if you represent the extent choice by using just 8 bits, you can reduce it to probably just 300 kbytes. From, so from, from the original size to, the, to 8 bits, it's reduced by almost eight times. If you notice here, you can actually all, almost get away with also five bits as well, if you can allow your application to do that. So pruning and quantization is an uh, efficient way to actually reduce the model size. Um, as a byproduct of pruning, though, you can actually also improve the accuracy. Um, if you do, what, once you do the first training using the dense network, you do uh, pruning to reduce it to a sparse network. You then, when you train on this, you force the network to learn specific items. But sometimes there are still losses in particular information. So another way to improve on those is just repopulate the, the network again, and then you train again. This actually is an efficient way to actually improve performance as well. Um, on Google Event, we found that this actually improves the performance by um, so this. This is split so. Originally, we were showing the accuracy. This one is actually showing the error. So, with the Google Edit using the dense, uh, dense sparse dense approach, you can reduce the error by almost 1.1 1, 1, 1, 1 times. BTG Edit actually get a, got a great boost. It increased the, increased, in, decreased the error by four times, beating Google and Net. Uh, ResNet and ResNet, uh, ResNet 18, ResNet 50 uh, each got about 1.2% uh, error reduction. So, these are not, uh, not small. Um, trivial uh, improvements. So, using this approach, you can do you can improve the uh, you can improve the tra uh, training accuracy. Um, so, we talked a little about uh, quantization of the weights, um, improving the training. But another side of the problem is actually activation. So, when you do um, when you do the inference, uh, the in input image size is actually much is pretty large. For a given image, it might be something like 200 by 224 by 224. And then you pass it in through the network, the channel size gets larger. So it actually, came, it actually is a large, it, it's a large portion of the memory, memory use. So how do you actually quantize the act activations? Um, if you look here, what we've shown here is the activation and weight distributions of the model. Um, ways you can quantize using uh, the, the, the quantization approaches we mentioned. Uh, the activations, and you can also do uh, linear quantization. But if you just do linear quantization um, and you train the network, sometimes it's not, the performance is not, it's not that well. So what we found is that um, you can use a value-aware quantization to actually improve the performance. So what does that mean? Uh, instead of quantizing the activations directly, you only quantize the activations up to a certain level. So with these, um, these uh, activations are represented using uh, three bits, for example, and the rest you represent as uh, full, full, full scale, uh, full floating points, um, full, full 32 bits floating point uh, representation. Because um, the higher the waste, it's simply that it's more information. So with that, you can actually be able to retain more information where you're actually doing the training. Um, using this approach, you can actually reduce the activation weights quite, quite a bit. You can even do on-device training with this approach. For example, SqueezeNet, um, the original model size was only just a, a, a few hundred K bytes. 
but the activations is actually 1.5 gigabytes. If you use activation uh, polarization, you can reduce that to just 640 megabytes. Mobile net, similar, same, similar uh, situation. Uh, the activation set, memory use is around 7.3. If you reduce it with uh, activation quantization, you can reduce it to 1.1. ResNet also from 9 gigabytes to 1.52. You notice that uh, the, the line on the top is actually the image net accuracy. You see that there's almost no drop in, um, in when you're actually doing this quantization. All right. Um, that's a quick uh, introduction of like uh, different techniques. Um, now we'll dive into a little bit more talk, talk, talk a little bit more about um, uh, architecture search. So all the previous method I mentioned is actually just um, modifying the model as it is, quantizing the quantizing the ways, quantizing quantizing the architectures. Um, this is only one part of the one, one part of the work. If we can actually all get more efficient models, then that this is actually an even better approach. Getting efficient models previously has been done mostly through human, human understanding. So the only way we spend more time looking at it and see how it gets your group. So moving from AlexNet to EGT using higher parameters, EGT to RuleNet with uh, deeper networks, from GoogleNet to ResNet, even deeper networks. There's a lot more work actually also like combining different, um, different uh, layers from different parts of the network to go deeper. But all these things would, would require a long time. So automatic neural object search deals with problem actually, instead of doing human-based um, search, you use, a, you use computers to help you uh, find better networks. So you use machine learning to search for machine learning architectures. Well, um, on this end, we have done two works uh, to, to um, work towards this goal. One is a model adaptation framework. Um, so what is a model adaptation framework? Um, so for, for different uh, mobile devices, typically uh, the hardware would actually um, be different. Each, each different type of hardware can have different performances. Um, so convolutional kernels or decisions or libraries, these would actually all result in different uh, latency. Sometimes, um, if a smaller, smaller kernel size versus a large kernel size, if the memory footprint is the same, you can actually run at the same speed. So sometimes it might be good to actually choose a 5 by 5 kernel over 3 by 3 which you might actually get a better performance. So how do we do that? Well, if you just look at the whole network, sometimes there's, there's a, a whole bunch of layers, and you have all these uh, parameters inside. Um, the number of uh, search space you have to look through into is quite large. Just just give an example, like if you search for a kernel size 3x3, 5x5, five five, or even 7x7, seven seven, uh, that's free. You might have to uh, consider sometimes um, uh, like if you use a mobile mobile net model, there's expansion ratio. So if there's a there's expansion ratio that could that could have probably six six other choices. You also have like a channel number of channels within each layer that can actually uh, have more than tens. So you have like 20, 20 different options that you can choose from inside each layer, of, and you have ten layers that would be twenty to the ten times. So the search space is pretty large. You need to search through that search space to find efficient models. <clears throat> if you do this, just, uh, just do through a proof first approach, that won't actually work. To do this efficiently, what we did is that we built a um, method to actually try to uh, do an efficient evolutional search. We tried to estimate the accuracy. Uh, this can be done by um, using the base network and doing a random sampling of the, of the, of the search space and using uh, Golden Process Evasion for Conversation to try to, uh, to estimate the accuracy. Once that, you can actually do, um, get, a good, get a sense of where you, which direction you need to go. On the latency side, since most operations are dependent on hardware, we can sim simply just run, pre-test them using different kernels, different, uh, different sizes, different channels, using that to build an uh, operator latency lookup table. Once you have these operation latency lookup table, then you can have a prediction, a, a latency predictor. 
Similarly, for similar fashion, you can use that to also predict for energy as well. So with accuracy prediction, latency prediction, and energy prediction, we can then uh, create efficient models that's accuracy, latency, and energy aware. Um, the main we call this data detection framework is called uh, CamNet, which, uh, which comes from Chameleon Net. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a short a result of, um, of our adaptation results. Um, there's a lot on the curve, so I'll go through them um, from top to bottom. On the top is mobile net uh, v2. You can see that the, the, it, uh, on behind it shows that it's 234, which it means the input resolution. Typically, if you want to uh, speed up your network, there's two options. One is to change the input size to a smaller size. The other is to try to scale the channels that's, with, that's used within the, within the network. So the curve you see with the mobile dev V2, which is the blue one, this one is this curve is traced by changing the channel size uh, downscaling them. Um, but you can, you can see that if you just change the resolution at, uh, to say 192, you get a performance when compared to actually scaling the channel size. So um, people try to find different ways to try to find a better, better performance and trying to curve out like a better form better curve on top. Um, MobileNet has these performances. Um, MNASNet, which is also a, a network architecture search uh, method, has a performance actually shown here, also pretty good. Uh, ShuffleNet is another flavor of, um, of a vision model. It has a performance right here. here. And CabNet is our ours. So because we are, hard, we're, we are hardware aware and latency aware, we are able to find out the ones that are that works best for Samsung S8. And then we can actually get, get a performance that um, outperforms all the others. So if we look at just the last point where you have focus on just four milliseconds, we have much, uh, uh, much higher uh, accuracy. Um, CQ is one, can, one uh, situation for the, for the hardware. We can also, also run it on the DSP device. If you did use DSP, typically you have a better kernel to run uh, the convolution. So you get a little bit better performance compared to the CPU. Um, you can see that, uh, for example, under the same latency constraints at 30 milliseconds, it gets, gains about 1.3% 1. 1. Uh, uh, accuracy for, uh, improvement. At, a at, a, uh, at the lower end of 60, at uh, 4 milliseconds, it gets uh, almost a 4% improvement. So, I talked about, um, so all these methods are actually um, still based on looking at adjusting the, um, adjusting the parameters of a given architecture. But you can actually also do um, architecture search directly. So when you talk about architecture search, you'll be looking, like, looking at something like um, uh, MobileNet is using inverted residuals um, to help with their, with their network. ShuffleNet is using a group convolution and doing shuffle across different layers. Um, all these can be actually put as a single element within the search space that you can actually search for. Um, traditionally, well, not traditionally, in the past few years, a lot of people have looked into this problem. Um, one in particular approach is actually doing a um, genetic programming based approach where you, um, where you form, form different architectures um, try to run those network to figure out the top 10 uh, best performing models. You move, mutate it slightly or you join them together and try to find, to run it again to see if you actually better models. So typically this approach is uh, pretty random and it takes a lot of GPU time to actually find out better models. Um, in differential ne network architecture search, check your search. Instead of doing, uh, instead of doing um, genetic programming, um, we propose a way to actually search the space uh, using directly using the differential and, uh, network architecture search. What this means is that we can actually create a so, uh, what that means is that we can create a stochastic super net where each layer contains all these different um, different parts. Sorry, it's not working. So each uh, layer is actually. Um, each layer actually contains all the different blocks within your search space. And we use a method called double softmax so that it can actually, 
you can actually figure out which uh, building block to use. And when you train the network, um, it can decide which building blocks to use. For example, the distribution here, it uh, points out to um, what actually what actually what actual architecture is used within each layer. So with this, you can build up build up uh, different types of layers. To just give an idea, um, on the top are six different configurations or basic architectures that we use to search for. Um, we search with different methods. Um, on the top four, a top actually the top. Um, Top six are architectures that we search for. Um, you can actually make it also a hardware dependent. Um, like uh, uh, this one here, this is a search specifically for Samsung S8, or you can actually search architectures specifically for iPhone X. We create our search space so that it actually can contain different types of networks. For example, MobileNet um, 2 has a architecture that's shown below, whereas MSS has this other configuration network. Using this approach, uh, we get a performance that's shown here. Um, it's much better than uh, MobileNet E2, and then also better than ShovelNet E2, um, and a little better than MSNet as well. And if you remember, uh, the MSNet actually has a performance that's uh, almost similar to uh, the model adaptation framework. So, um, this actually, because you're actually doing the architecture search, you have a little more space in finding better architectures. And one thing I mentioned is that uh, you can target devices. Um, you can find the best architecture for different devices. Um, shown here is the performance for iPhone X and Samsung 8. On the blue, on the blue bar is when you train for, you search for a model that's specifically for the iPhone X. It performs better on the iPhone X, but not on the Samsung S8. And um, if you train on the train for the you train the search for the model for the Samsung S8, it works better on the S8 and not not the iPhone X. So um, to recap a little bit, um, to do all model application, there's uh, there's different goals that you would look into. Um, if you want a smaller size. A simple approach is to do crony. You could do crony, you could typically remove 60 to 70 percent of the um, dead waste. If you use weight train, you do a uh, King's Cross chain model that's waste, you use this representation, you can actually reduce um, the representation even further. You can even do more quantization um, uh, to re reduce it to even fewer bits. To get higher high accuracy, uh, you could use dense sparse sense. Um, to try to figure out how you can actually get better, better accuracy. Um, another thing I haven't talked about distillation today is that you can actually use a, a larger network to, um, to train a smaller network. This is a technique we call uh, distillation. To, this would help on um, um, increasing the accuracy of smaller models. And finally, uh, for faster speed, we talked a little bit about um, a latency aware uh, model length, which is um, adapting the model to um, target a device to improve speed. You can go to our automatic architecture search to find uh, better, better efficient models for uh, different devices. Um, you can also try um, the below two are things that we haven't talked about today. You can try uh, brand parallelizing all the network, getting the networks to try to see if you can actually. Um, uh, run things more in parallel to get uh, faster speed. And finally, you can also go with low precision networks, where the, this low, pre low precision means um, the precision of the weights and not the, the final results. Um, but typically, uh, low precision networks are, require some, some level of hardware, hardware support. Um, nowadays, I think uh, uh, networks with uh, like three, bit, three bits can actually perform pretty well pretty comparable to actually full, full precision networks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So um, I think this is the most, uh, this, all the things I want to talk about uh, making models efficient. Lastly, I'll just show a quick demo of real-time post estimation. Um, the thing that you saw with butterflies is uh, the final effect. Uh, this is a demo of the actual bits. Oops, sorry. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so what you saw here was actually a master of CN to go running on the device. This was running, um, this demo we did in 2017 actually. So this is running on the Samsung S9 or Nest, I think it's a, sorry, Galaxy, Galaxy S7 actually. This was running at 20 frames per second. Uh, the information we get from the image is the bounding box of the person and the key points, which is the joints. Um, these are actually running frame by frame, so we're not actually using any time time information. So the speed is actually pretty, pretty fast. Um, the network itself uh, is, is a master CNN network, network that looks like this. Um, the, the it's a detection network where you transform the, or the input image into a smaller feature map, and then you have a region proposal network to pick out interesting points within the image. And then you do a cropping and resizing to a smaller map, and then use that to uh, infer a class and the, the refined bounding box. Once you have those, then you can then uh, get a larger map and do um, mask, uh, mask generation or like um, key point generation, which finds like the different key points. Um, shown here is, a, is a, another graph that actually points this out. You have the key point head that uh, does uh, the find, the find finding the key, the key points and the segmentation can. Uh, the original of our network is actually pretty huge. Um, it actually doesn't perform as, as fast. What we did the, to actually speed it up is to, well, as we mentioned, reduce the number of layers inside the network, reduce the, the channel size, try to compress the model, uh, try to prune the model. Another thing that helps with actually making this uh, fast and runnable on a single device is that you, um, use a smaller detection head. Uh, one of the things about uh, detection networks is that for each different uh, interesting parts in the image, it runs a detection head. So if you find too much things, uh, this becomes too heavy to run on the device. So you reduce, you, you want to use a small detection head. And you limit yourself to some, some, only some set, a subset of the interesting points in the image. But of course, if you want, has to, if you want higher accuracy, uh, you still want to have high input resolution. With that, um, I, I thank you for your attention, and that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about today. And we're also hiring as well, so if you're interested, um, you can uh, use this email below. <laughs>